reaction was whether or not those staff are cheaply available to yourselves? Yes, absolutely. They're all the rights and the terms are preserved. They're the be cheaply available to us. Yeah, there's no question of that. Um, and also on, on staffing, I'm thinking there's also another moment where staffing would change, and that's when HS2 services are introduced. That, that's quite a game changer. Well, with that, because that's a new service, there wouldn't be any staff to transfer. Oh, no, no, I'm just thinking about the creation of more jobs. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, uh, just going back to uh, uh, Councillor Stockton's uh, point about Uncor, uh, one of the particular problems, and now it's getting very specific, but one of the major problems we have in Uncor is actually around parking. Uh, and I'm wondering whether that you're going to have a review of your parking charges uh, to encourage people to park in the car park rather than on the streets. Yeah, okay, I shall find out. Yeah, we, we're going to be introducing 900 additional parking spaces along the at stations where we are operating, where we run this facility. And I'll, I'll find out if there's any, any intention to review the charges. Thank you. Thanks, but hopefully um, moving forward it would be true. Um, I commute quite a lot to London and we're delighted basically um, that we plan to introduce um, two trains each hour um, going forward from Liverpool to London. Um, however, we know this, this is subject to ORR approval. So what can we do um, to ensure um, you get the approval in these services to operate? Additionally, um, Bank holiday, obviously, you've alluded to engineering work, and if you look at Christmas and Boxing Day, would that would we have a service around that time as well? And Chair, if you could make a comment with another one, of course. Um, it's, I mean, a lot of things are true. <laughs> there will be new trains, there will be more services, and we are going to be investing in better fares for passengers, that type of thing. So hopefully you're going to, you are going to see a difference here. It's, but it's a company that's going to be... Um, it's going to undergo a, uh, a lot of change in only a short period of time uh, and has to prepare for high speed too. So we've got a, a, a lot going on there. Now the extra services to Liverpool, I think we're, um, uh, we're guaranteeing now. Um, we, we, um, we had discussions, we looked at the timetable and those are now as, as hardwired as they can be into the timetable that will run from 2022. And um, what we'll be looking at is what else can be done on top of that. So the, the simple highlights I've given you there about calls to Liverpool, Liverpool South Parkway, they will happen and we'll be looking at where we stop in between, how we get the best of those services for other connectivity in the, the city region. So that will, that will happen. Um, the, yeah, the engineering works is uh, I, I, it's, it's such a difficult one, such a difficult one. The, the, there's no point in taking services away from people when they need them. Uh, most, and you've highlighted probably the times that they need a lot of people rely on the most. Um, and then there's other times when commuters couldn't get to work if we did it other times. But we have got in this um, uh, partnership an alliance agreement with Network Rail, uh, and we'll be working with what we call the Route Supervisory Board to try and get, try and solve that tension between Network Rail trying having to hit its its targets for um, refurbish uh, for um, work on the line. And, uh, and the, the company having to keep services open for passengers. So there's a, there's, a, there's a push now which is even stronger to get that balance right. And uh, uh, I would like to see services running all the time, but I accept that they've got to run on safe tracks. Thank you. The other question, obviously, um, you know, we Anticipate any, any problems uh, from uh, from uh, Brexit it happens. It's uh, something that, that there's been people looking at fuel prices and things, uh, uh, which I, again I don't think will uh, create any problems for us. But with the Italian uh, dimension, we'll have no trouble bringing the experts in to work on the um, uh, on the development of high speed services, even if we do find ourselves in a, a new world. Got Harry next. <coughs> um, hi, my, my 
intention had been to issue Good Afternoon in Italian, but <laughs> the early references to Mussolini had decided against it. <laughs> um, he confirmed that there will be an increase to two trains per hour, and you've reinforced that confirmation in the last, in the last answer, uh, between uh, Liverpool and London. And that in addition to the stop at Runcorn, there will be a stop at Liverpool South Parkway. What consideration has been given to the infrastructure constraints uh, of platforming and signalling to allow this to happen? Uh, Super 11 car Pendolino services. And how can the Liverpool City region support making this happen? Well, the, the, it's going to happen one service per hour. Of, of, the, of those two is going to call there. Um, quite how they're going to get around the platform lengths, um, I'll have to come back to on the approach. But uh, if there's something that has to be uh, worked on there, if there's investment required or collaboration required to overcome the, uh, any particular difficulties, yeah, we'll definitely work together with you on that. Thank you. Uh, we've got Francis and then Patrick. So the, um, the, platform, the platform access may not be as, as good as it is in Liverpool. There's the, the different heights of platforms that from the uh, national network are very awkward, but we'll have the staff to um, help with that. And there's other solutions as well. You can create the hubs that you, that you probably alluded to, to help people um, avoid. Uh, uh, yes, though the trains, as I say, they'll be accessible. There'll be, um, there'll be room for wheelchairs on every train, no question of that. Um, you talk about whether they go down the, uh, if, yeah. So on the Pendolino, it's, no, they, we've been asked the same question about um, moving uh, buggies, Charles buggies down uh, through the Pendolinos in particular, where the shape of the train, because it tilts, makes it a very narrow train. So we're looking at what we can do with the replacement seat program to give, maybe save a bit of space there, but not make it uncomfortable for passengers and create more space for accessibility down the, the aisles. Um, uh, but with the new trains, we'll have more opportunity to do that. So we'll be um, uh, we'll have more information on that when we announce the new trains. Oh, thank you. Um, also about the apprentice, um, I'm pleased to hear that you're taking apprenticeships on as well. Thank you, Peter. No, no, I was pleased as well. I've got children of a principal age, so I think it's terrific, a terrific start for uh, for anyone. It saves a hell of a lot of university costs as well. Please, Mark, been scrapped in six weeks' time. So, um, Patrick. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Liverpool City region is, is committed to a, uh, in terms of local economic development and regeneration, a community wealth building model. Uh, inherent within that, in terms of the local economy, is to try and maximise injections and minimise leakages. And you mentioned several things which would which contribute very positively to this aspiration, particularly around uh, using your leverage around uh, influence and labour market stuff, uh, supply um, supply chains, procurement and uh, zero hour contracts. The city region is developing a fair employment charter. So uh, in essence, the bones are there to, are to contribute to the development of community wealth building within the city region. Would your uh, company be prepared to work with the city region to actually develop a plan to, with your company to bring all these things together to contribute to community wealth building? Yes. Yes, uh, yes is a short answer. The, the, um, the, the memorandum of understanding or letter of support that we signed with the authority commits us to um, now starting to set up a, a formal uh, joint partnership which will have governance, which will have um, uh, uh, objectives and that we can sh that are shared objectives, uh, and are, that is very much a, a shared objective. The, the, this is a business now that's going to look well beyond uh, the provision of a service between A and B. So we'll, that would be one of the issues I think that we will put down for that joint working in this formal group, which I'm, I'm hoping we can have a first meeting once 
once the, the, the current surplus is over, uh, early 2020, and um, start putting some uh, framework around that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else uh, before I have a bit of a, a wash up? Um, first and foremost, well, just a few things from, from me, Captain. Um, great to hear about, as Ken was talking about, the kind of the bus rail integration. Just a little bit of a plea to make sure that it, it happens because we've had a few um, challenges, I think it's fair to say, with your sister companies, uh, Transpennine Express, are meant to. If you get on one of their trains, the information screens tell you about local taxi firms, don't tell you anything about bus services. And as part of Transport for the North, we're having quite a few difficulties with your bus division being prepared to sign up to the Smart in the North integrated ticketing. So, if you can make sure you live your commitments and, if possible, take that back to the, the mothership and that's a few heads together. Um, second question I was going to ask was, um, great to hear about the upgrade of the Pendolino fleet. Is that going to happen at Alstom's plant in Witness? I think it is. Because okay. that's brilliant, because that one depends a lot of high-skilled, well-paid yeah. engineering jobs that are new to our region, in our region. So that's, a, that's a real kind of good news uh, story. Um, third question that I was going to ask as well is, um, obviously you'll be overseeing the first instances of, of the high-speed rail um, services. Uh, one of our sort of strong uh, aspirations is a full high-speed type service, utilise HS2 and the emerging Northern Powerhouse Rail Network as a way of getting this even greater sort of direct connection. How, as the franchisee, will you be able to support us as a region and right across the world, actually making the case for and achieving that full Northern Powerhouse Rail Network and <coughs> full High Street 2 Network? Well, so there's a, uh, you're members of Transport for the Yeah. And, um, and we're, 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 we're in discussion with them. The same, we have a, a, a plan with them to create the, the strategic. Uh, the, we're under uh, investigation by the Competition and Mergers Authority today because we're, there's a number of services that are operated by our sister company, TPE, that overlap the services we would be operating as a West Coast operator. Now, these are two distinct entities. There'll be no collaboration between these businesses, and we're cooperating <coughs> with the, um, the, the merger and uh, the competition inquiry. Uh, but nevertheless, on things like timetable planning and um, uh, looking at the whole system, you at least you'll have two businesses that are working under one umbrella there. So I would hope that would be one way in which we could bring assistance. But we also will be working on, um, uh, we're, we're trying to, for the government, we're trying to maximize the, the value of the West Coast route and high speed, and then the people that will be using high speed and conventional. It's a very, it's a very complex picture. And it's why they've brought us in as a partner with commitments to High Speed 2 uh, and commitments to the government to deliver the best um, economic outcome from all of that money that's going in there. So I think you'll be working with a company that's, as I say, not just focused on A to B, keeping them, uh, keeping trains running, uh, safety stations. We've got a much, much broader commitment to achieve the maximum value of whatever comes out of the end of this with we know there's reviews going on right now and whatever the decisions are on the power trail. <coughs> we've, set, we've created a company structure that's going to make sure that we are collaborating actively and proactively in all of these forums to make sure we, our decision making fits with this planning. I think it's the best way I can say now. It's not a traditional uh, top structure where you would have someone like me coming along and giving you a monthly report on services and uh, statistics. This is a, a, a collaborative business that's got some heavy expectations from government to do that. So that's the best I can say on the hand chair. So. That's fine. And the, the final one, um, will you end the annoying commentary of the Pendolino toilets? <laughs> Sometimes it's the only person I hear all day. <laughs> oh, so, no, it's, uh, uh, we've had, it's amazing. We have had a lot of um, uh, comment on that commentary. So yeah, we were looking and the smell. <laughs>
Great. Yeah, I was, I was more bothered about Kevin from Milton Keynes. The competition went over. Yeah, so anything you can do to cease that would be kind of uh, exceptional. Thanks ever so much for coming and giving us the presentation today. Really appreciate it. I think what I'd finally say is that we're really committed to working with you. The fact that we aren't going to be getting those two trains an hour from Liverpool and everywhere in between down to London is a huge win for us. So we'll do everything that we can to work with you to make sure that that comes into being. And equally, we want to work with you very closely on maximising the potential South Park, Road, Run Corn, Smart Ticketing and all those bits. Yeah, I mean, so, Smart Ticketing is something we definitely uh, come back on because we can't do it with other yeah. And good luck for the 8th of December and beyond. And if you'd be prepared to come back in a year's time just to let us know how it's going, that well, would be great. Well, I think what we'll do, Chair, is we'll be uh, coming to you for um, the first meeting to set up a joint working group so that we'll have a, a structure around our reporting and clear objectives for the relationship. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank we do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then. Moving on to the, the next item, which is the Transforming Cities Fund update. And I think Shane's going to present this one for us. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the report uh, the committee is on the Transforming Cities program. Uh, the background is uh, the combined authority to secure 172 and a half million for capital for capital gain grant from the Transforming Cities Fund for local transport investments over a five-year period. Uh, the aim of the fund is to uh, support programs of interlink interventions which which will change sustainable transport connectivity in key communities within the major city region. Uh, in July, the uh, Liverpool City Region Authority agreed a commission plan and they set out uh, the three uh, priority things for the investment. Being one was uh, expanding public transport network and to meet new areas of demand, improving the appeal for scheme of theme two on public transport, particularly bus, uh, and scheme two, uh, theme three was intervening in health and wellbeing. Uh, to assist in the programme, uh, the organisation uh, appointed myself as lead officer in the last three months to, uh, to lead on the delivery of the programme. Uh, I report up uh, through the uh, Transform Cities Fund board that uh, Director of Resources chairs. And we've already started that by having a workshop in September of this year. And all the sponsors for all the interventions that are scheduled later in the report uh, came to the workshop just to set out the arrangements, the governance, the guidance, uh, because one aspect is development of the business case and the interpretation of the requirements for the business case, as uh, you may imagine, is quite different for each type of intervention. It was to give a bit of guidance and then to introduce the support team from the CA to uh, guide the, the, uh, each of the sponsors to be successful in their business case application and subsequently to implement the intervention. Uh, specifically, uh, funding was brought forward for, for three schemes. Uh, and they were there at Line item 3.6 in terms of uh, the uh, smart ticket portal uh, and successors to Walrus, uh, Mercy Ferries, and the uh, Fund for Sustainable Urban Transport Development. Um, within uh, section 312 uh, are a list of the uh, 17 interventions, eight of them related to theme one in terms of improving and expanding the public transport network to meet new areas of. of uh, demand. Uh, the second theme, there's four interventions identified in that table in respect of uh, improving in, uh, the appeal to the public for the use of bus against private vehicles. And the third is intervention on well-being. There are um, five schemes that, that are identified uh, as part of the program itself. It's only at the early stages of this program, so we're at, uh, to a large extent, if you like, feasibility stage on each of those aspects. So from a program delivery perspective, I suppose we're setting up that reporting arrangement, we're setting out monitoring of how we'll be able to monitor that overall program and being satisfied that uh, appropriate uh, arrangements are in place for each intervention so that we come through on delivery and hit that timeline of March 2023. The program is challenging, uh, it has a significant element, it's fair to say, uh, on rail, probably two, around about two thirds of the value of that program. Is, uh, is dominated by rail and with, uh, with the rail schemes you recognise that they are a particular challenge to bring to fruition uh, both in setting up and in terms of working and delivering those schemes but we're starting uh, an early process of that. Network Rail have 
have restructured recently and we're looking to have meetings uh, through by the end of this month to see how we might develop further from the three interventions we did in the last five years, uh, the Gold North, Holton Curve and Youth New Willows, to see if we can improve both the way we work together and the timing of that. So I pick out the rail one because it's a very dominant feature of the programme itself. Uh, indications are at the moment we've, we've had the workshop, we've then uh, had uh, detailed discussions with each of the 17 intervention leagues and sponsors and uh, we're starting that process of early uh, approvals and there are some successes where we're taking through approvals and a couple of reports will come off the CA on uh, two, three, three of those interventions that we've got early work underway. Um, just a, that's an only we're happy to take it I'm sure we've got questions. I've got Steve first and then John. Uh, yeah, two, two issues. The, actually, the final two in the uh, table uh, on page 13. Uh, the, the first one is the uh, accessibility at stations. We will very shortly or very rapidly move to 100% accessibility at platform level with our new trains and our new fleets. It's something to be, be proud of. But I understand at the moment we are around about 62 percent, is it, of accessibility, full accessibility at the actual stations. So one of one things laughing at the other in many respects. And as I understand it, we with through this fund will have our end of the bargain. But the other end of the deal is is that the access for all fund run nationally. So I'm anxious to know how we can prod that money coming forward more rapidly. If we we've got our part of the bargain in place to get you know to do these schemes, we expect the, the, the government, whoever it may be, uh, to, to, to match that, that other end of the fund. And there is great demand out there and there will be we will increase demand because we will have saying to people our trains are fully accessible, which will only highlight the fact that our stations are. So that's comments and question together. And then the other one while I'm, I'm here is the connecting middle waters. And I understand it's under the, uh, the theme of intervening health and well-being, and that's understandable where Little Waters is. But it, is there an ability to, to morph these schemes to the other one? Because one is about meeting excess, uh, you know, extra demand. But one of the plans for Little Waters is that there will be a lot of extra demand because it's one of the biggest foreign applications in Europe. Uh, and the expansion and the, the you know, people living there and businesses will move there. So. So as, as the sort of scheme <coughs> itself moves on, it's a, are we able to transform these into different blocks? Because uh, we understand, you know, whilst a green corridor might be applicable now, we would want to be moved rapidly to a, a properly integrated transport solution for Willow Waters, whatever that might be. <coughs> the outcome. So they're my sort of comments and questions, Shane. Thank you. Shane? I could pick up on the access for all. Yeah. Uh, quite right. There's a, uh, there's a historical aspect to the, to the rail network from the Victorian times that we have been working through that access. It's not easy. At the moment, we have a 15 million investment programme for access to all. It will pick up five of further stations, so we'll improve that percentage. But of course, it is a long-term investment. And what's been, what we've been doing is, all the way through on the access for all, we've been trying to improve that as we go through. But it's still a, a backlog, historically, that, that we need to work through. Those costs for those access for all, if you think about it, it's uh, five schemes, so three million a scheme to, to put lifts and put access and put drop curves and bring accessibility, better accessibility to those stations. It is a, it, it, you need a continuous program. And we've been able to do it through a continuous program. They've also brought what was called the mid-tier program, which is additionality, but it's for small aspects. So where there might be an improvement through uh, access for ramps or barriers, I call it small scale, that, that falls outside the remit. We've also applied for some money for that. So it's an ongoing process. I wouldn't deny we're, we're a long way off 100%, but we are making improvements year on year through funds of that, uh, of that nature. So we've got five. Of the five that are going forward, we should complete the design aspect by April next year, and then we'll be implementing them across those areas. Where are waters? Where are waters? I think on the world water side, I, I think I said, I suppose, a little bit earlier, it's at the start of that process. And perhaps if I just pick up on world waters, because in effect it's got two corridors alongside it. So it's got uh, phase one and phase two, and it's linked to three other phases, which are public realm transit improvements that we need to work on. So I get your point on the wider connectivity. I'd say that's why we're doing this feasibility work to get that right on that side. So 
uh, uh, sort of that, that aspect, the feasibility side is one that we take forward. It's partly split into uh, sustainability for walking, cycling on sections of it, and then public realm, and then connectivity between those environments. So early stages, but but it will be part of that package. That's why we're at this stage. Thank you, John. Thanks, Jeff. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation, Shane. I noticed that the time frame for the disbursement of the funding is uh, 31st of March 23, which is quite a short time scale. And I also appreciate that it's, it's impossible to give sort of um, indicative amounts of money for each of these projects because of commercial sensitivity. But I'm just wondering, is it possible to give us any sort of indication of the time frame that these are actually going to be developed in? The money's gone by 31st of March 2023. One of these likely to come on the street, basically. Thank you. I think uh, with the work that we're doing, we've just been going through to establish the base programme. So when we held a workshop and we've now interviewed the sponsors, we've now looked at um, the plan packages, we're now putting together the cash flow and the expenditure. All of that is the early work that we're doing at the moment. It is a little bit back end loaded, the programme, and I think that's probably dominated the fact you've got two thirds of expansion linked to rail. And rail is not a, a, an early spender by the time we back, it's back end by nature. But we, we would have a, a better insight the next time we perhaps do an update, but we can give a bit more idea about what we might be doing year on year. You know, so the, 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 the valid questions we're just working through to establish some of those details. I've got Linda next. <coughs> some of my previous colleagues uh, who are no longer with us, like Mal Sharp, who used to do the Coos Cats, who's kept the project going. And what, like the Lost Boroughs, mostly have put a lot of investment into <coughs> regeneration, and especially in the, the Tower Hill, Shevington area where that built lane is. So it's really welcomed by the residents, and I think it's going to be a game changer for, for the area. So I would just like to thank everybody who's making this happen. Yes, it's a, it is a challenging project and it, it will be to deliver. Um, there is some um, other aspects of one of the interventions, so uh, we're doing some work on the rolling stock and battery technology. Because for Headbolt then to um, come to fruition, uh, it means that uh, you're building a station, but you're building a mile of track to that station. So we're, we're looking at that. So we've done some, uh, through the intervention, we've got business case work going forward. If that's successful, then that might help some reduce uh, some of those costs of that one mile link through to, to Headbolt Lane. So they're quite interrelated, some of these interventions, but, but certainly it's a big project and uh, yeah, we're glad to get on the way. Yeah, absolutely. I'd also sort of put in some of echo all of the, the thanks in terms of um, everyone that's been involved. Um, Headbolt Lane figures in the 1972 local transport plan, so it shows just how long it's been in the, the ether. But Steve, Steve Rotherham is very, very clear uh, with us that he will be the next brand new station in the city region and he wants it delivered in as fast a time scale as is possible. So I think we should all get very excited about the deliveries of that station, just like you and your community are. I've got Jerry, then um, Pat, then I've got Ken, and I've got Patrick as well. So. Thank you. Jane, as, as uh, Steve uh, great frustration about accessibility to stations in the rural south and uh, and with in general. But could we have more information about the criteria used because you know trying to explain this this whole thing to the ordinary public towns could be difficult. I could pick it up I suppose to a large extent and I will provide a bit more information outside of the meeting. But that the access for all, so the inputs for the access for all is network rail it's Mergy Travel and it's the train operating company. So uh, when, when you ask that, you, you, you'll get feedback for the fact that it's a, it's, a, it's a joint contribution to achieve that program. And that's it's quite a complicated that one. But I'll, I'll produce the guidance that, that they provide. But just that backdrop, it, that, that there is a partnership aspect to that. Although I think it's, it's well worth just making the points again. We, the city region, are investing they can be half a billion quid in new trains and infrastructure upgrades. I think uh, from some of the indicative work, it wouldn't cost anything close to that to get all of the existing stations that aren't 
at step three level to that. So I think there's a, a large challenge back to government, isn't there? That we've done more than our bit. And actually, if they could find, for argument's sake, £100 million, we could make our whole network completely step three. Yeah. And that's exactly where we should be headed towards, in my opinion. Okay, I've got Pat next. Thanks very much, Chair. I just wanted a bit more clarification on the World Waters uh, question that was raised earlier. Um, you know, you'll be aware now that we've got uh, significant planning approvals around World Waters, that uh, there's quite a lot of momentum now around that, and we've got the new investments in the public realm in World Waters starting in, <coughs> in January, so there's a much more heightened sense of momentum behind the whole scheme. We've got the Eureka project as well nearby, which is due to come on in a few years' time. So getting the transport right is obviously totally fundamental, and certainly I've been rather frustrated at how long it's taking the various agencies to kind of come to a, a view around this and, and really kind of put some definitive plans on paper about how World Water is going to be transported in the future. Uh, otherwise, you know, we really risk undermining the whole scheme and just uh, creating another kind of car dependent development which we really, really want to avoid and which Peel, in fairness, have, have put out their, their stall in that sense in, in creating something quite different. And you'll be aware that, uh, you know, that they're, they've been pushing for quite a while is the streetcar proposal. So a couple of questions really around that. You know, to what extent are we actually engaging with Peel around this? And to what extent would the, the green travel corridor either complement or potentially conflict with the idea of a streetcar uh, proposal? I think, so. I think uh, first of all, I suppose part of the phasing of the work of the green corridor, so um, you know, around what side Square, uh, <coughs> land uh, south of Birkenhead, an emerging function from the world aspect of that. So we are looking at that, but we're at that early stages of the feasibility work. You mentioned about Eureka, of course, for Eureka, obviously that's one of the SIFT approved schemes, and it also is one of the schemes that sits along our plans for uh, work that we need to the uh, landing stage at Seacombe. So we've been very much involved in both the uh, arrangements and lease arrangements for uh, for uh, Eureka to come into uh, to Spaceport as part of that. So there's been a long lead in planning aspect to that. And on the delivery of that, we'll have to do the integration of program between renewing the landing stage that we need to do because that's a limited timeline on it, and providing access to Eureka to finish the project they are doing. They are on our steering group so that we do have an integrated program across those two bit of reference. In terms of streetcar, um, I, I think uh, the case of, we're doing quite a lot of investment to, 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 to when you look at the rolling stock, so you know the rolling stock that um, you know getting up towards half a billion pounds of investment. So we're putting a lot of investment and have done into stations so that you need to connect to those stations. How you connect to them is part of the discussion that's going on with Peel. And also, the amount of money we put into the buses and getting connectivity for buses, they were in our long-term plans. They've been in that domain five, five years for, for rail and three years for, for bus. So our plans on the wider network and then connecting to the wider network is quite well known. So on the streetcar side, to a large extent, it's never up to this point produced a business case that actually is able to wash its face. So we're working with them, maybe there may be some better connectivity options, so we will be part of those discussions. You're covering quite a wide area there, and I'm, I suppose what I'm really outlining is the investment for transport, and what we need to do with development is to come in and link into those significant investments we put in place. So in, in answer to the streetcar, there's nothing active in front of itself in, in terms of the business case, because my understanding there were gaps identified, and I'm not sure they've been resolved to the best of my knowledge. I think it's um, probably worth me just mentioning as well just how important we all recognise that the, the Wirral Water development is going to be. It's going to be absolutely huge, not just for the Wirral, but for the whole city region. And I think you know, some of the kind of green concepts that we're, we're looking at about how we link Wirral Waters is really, really important, not least because a fortnight ago, myself and, and Steve physically got on our bikes with Simon O'Brien, did a bit of a bike ride around the region and went round much of the 
the Wirral Water site, looking at some really good infrastructure that Wirral Council's already put in place, with some really good site priority stuff already there that the council's delivered, and actually looking at what more needs to be, be delivered. So I think, you know, we're, we're striking now whilst the iron's hot, and that's a very good opportunity. I think it's worth mentioning, of course, with Wirral Waters and ambitions there, it, it is spread over quite a long period. So the path of Wirral Waters are 20 odd years plus. So what we have to do is build links as they move through that, <coughs> that development. So we think we can work on our working with Wirral to try and provide, in the first option, it might be a bus consideration because you actually haven't got sufficient uh, uh, critical mass to bring another investment in. So there are different ideas and we have done uh, short, medium term strategies for Wirral Waters that we have shared and the other certainly been part of too long. Patrick. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, my question relates to the cycle network. I, I am assuming that when you expand the site of the cycle network, it will be accommodating or bringing in the Cheshire Lines path, which runs through Sefton, which goes from probably Magor all the way through to Southport. I'm assuming that's, that's in the plan. That, but my second part of that is a bit of a, a kind of left field question. Running left, right next to the Cheshire Lines path is a bridleway. And it was a, a colleague before mentioned a bridleway on the road. And I was just wondering, in terms of the health and well-being agenda, is this project step extended as far as clearing up the bridleways that can be used by groups such as riding for the disabled? I'd have to go on up it's a while since I've been on a horse down that particular route myself. <laughs>